Well, welcome to the Aging Boomers, where we discuss many of the issues facing boomers and an aging population. I'm your host, Frank Sampson, and uh, thrilled to have you aboard. Uh, this is going to be uh, one of uh, many podcasts that we do uh, on this subject matter. Um, I've been uh, uh, and continue to do a, uh, uh, local radio shows and, uh, with the demand and, uh, uh, people wanting to get this more and more information, um, we're, we're doing this podcast on a regular basis. So thrilled to have you aboard. And, uh, we do has a, have as our guest today, Francine Toder, uh, Francine's, uh, psychologist, university faculty member, writer, lecturer, and author of three books. After more than 40 years devoted to her profession, she's taken up the cello, which we'll learn more about. She continues to write and feels passionately uh, about The Vintage Years, which is also the name of her newest book, The Vintage Years, Finding Your Inner Artist. Um, And we'll... uh, you know, she shows how those 60 years and older can rediscover themselves through the arts. Very, very interesting. So, Francine, welcome to the Aging Boomers. Thank you so much, Frank. It's a pleasure to be here. So, tell us kind of what inspired you to write the book. Well, as I was getting on in my career, after, as you said, more than 40 years of working as a, an academic psychologist and a practitioner, I began to think, is there anything else? And this is one of the questions that I focus on in the book as well, because we all get to the stage of life and kind of stop for a minute to take an assessment of where we are, where we're going, and uh, is there anything that we've wanted to do that we haven't done? Because the reality of being 55, 60, 65, we realize that life doesn't go on forever, uh, which of course young people don't know will happen. Uh, And at that point, I thought, yes, there are other things I want to do. I've always been a psychologist. I really didn't know anything else. But I thought, uh, what is it that I want to do? And if I'm wondering, then other people are wondering. I'd written before. I thought, I did want to write another book. And in the process of thinking about the subject matter, I also separately, but uh, at about the same time, thought, one of the things I'd love to do is play the cello. So I did some research about cello playing, thinking, well, certainly nobody my age starts playing an instrument like that. That's very complex. And I did find someone online, uh, a a documentary had been done about a woman who started playing the cello at 89. And I was really inspired by that. And I thought, I'd like to inspire others if I can be successful doing this too. So the two things happened at the same time. I decided to rent a cello. Uh, impulsively uh, dragged my husband to San Francisco where we went to a shop where I rented a cello and a case and a bow and thought I could possibly play music, which of course I couldn't. And at the same time, I thought, well, I'm going to work on a book. And so when I retired, I decided I need a rather lengthy project because I'm somebody that needs to have um, something to focus on. uh, That is is pretty demanding and uh, I need structure, which will, a lot of other people do, and I've talked about them in the book, the ways they can go about creating that structure. And in, in my research then, I realized that um, getting older required that you do different things. And I thought, I thought back to 50 years ago when I was in graduate school, when very little was known about the older brain. Uh, And when I was in my 20s, it really didn't matter. But as I got to be 70, I was interested in updates in neuroscience that would help me actually think about ways to keep my brain vigorous and to maintain, you know, physical and psychological well-being. So I I did my research, and I really discovered uh, that there are lifestyle and natural changes in the brain and hormonal functioning beyond age 60 that actually facilitate mastery of the fine arts in the way that really isn't possible for younger people. So I thought, well, if I could play a musical instrument and satisfy some of my own cognitive needs while finding pleasure, um, then that would be a fabulous combination. And so I realized that there were some reasons why the fine arts were 
the best way to do this, the best bang for the buck, you could say. There are a lot of um, reasons, both neurological reasons, and then there are reasons that, that really have to do with um, uh, history, the history of our species, in that uh, I, you know, and uh, that people, even ancient people, uh, were writing, uh, were telling stories, which is the forerunner of writing. They were also doing cave art, which was a way of sort of communicating, and uh, and they were and there were simple instruments like um, bone flutes and drums that are uh, stamp, time stamped, you know, uh, 40,000 years ago. So I, I realized that there is survival value in the fine arts. So it all began to come together. At least I thought, okay, I have a start. This is something that I would, I would like to focus on. And that's how I got started. That's great. That's great. So I, I, I'd like to just learn a little bit more about your research because, uh, as you know, I'm in the... Uh, senior care industry and uh you know work with families whose you know loved ones may have cognitive issues and we're always trying to educate people as we are on this show to you know get that you know utilize that brain i mean simple things like uh, if you brush your teeth with your right hand normally start brushing with your left do you know make the brain work in manners that uh, it's not used to. And I think, so in your research, you know, the fine arts, I think, it's, you know, that's fantastic. But did the research show that as, as long as somebody does something uh, to keep that brain active that it's not accustomed to through those first 60 years, let's say, um, that it would be advantageous, or is it, is it more the fine arts that um, you, you found this to be true? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think that you're hitting on something very important, and that is that after about age 60, the brain needs stimulation that requires what I call the, the sort of the magical triad, novelty, complexity, and problem solving. Those three are really, really critical um, to maximize neuronal production. That means to maximize the, the brain's um, uh, renewal of itself. And uh, I think that with people even in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's disease or dementia would benefit from activities that have novelty, complexity, and problem solving. Okay, novelty is newness. So yes, brushing your, uh, doing the things that have been automatic all of your life in a new way really do um, get the brain excited. And um, I, I focus on the fine arts because it really occurred to me through all of the research that the fine arts require, has all of the complexity, problem solving, and, and novelty that is sort of optimal and ideal. And I do hear from people that say, well, but I like to knit and I like to play golf. And, um, you know, these aren't fine arts. And yet, um, aren't they good for the brain, or doing Sudoku, or puzzles, uh, or uh, crossword puzzles. And it's not that I have any objection to these things. I just found if you've always done these things, then it's not novelty. Yes, some of those activities are complex, but they're not novel. So if you're going to continue doing something that you've always done, then you have to shake it up and do it in a different way. Yeah, I and need... I think that that is really important. But my research definitely does point to the fine arts as having all three of those things. So problem solving. Um, oh, I'll give you an example. One of one of the people in in the book is a woman who became um, uh, a, a, an artist. Um, and I I call that a visual artist because all of these, whether they're writers or they're musicians, they're artists. So. The vi one of the visual artists, she was a watercolor artist, and um, she did a church with a steeple, and the steeple didn't look quite right. And in some ways, it was an engineering um, task to figure out how to make that steeple look right, how to make it straighter. It was kind of le leaning a little bit, not exactly like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but it... Um, it needed something to change it, and, and that was an example of both problem solving and complexity. Um, so throughout, with the fine arts, there is always a challenge, a problem, 
uh, in in creating your art. So I I do believe that that's ideal. That that is the the best way to enhance. Uh, cognitive functioning, but I think not everyone is able to do those things. Well, frankly, um, I think that that most people are capable of taking a, a pad of paper and some colored pencils or um, watercolors or, uh, you know, taking a simple class uh, in pottery making. Um, I, I certainly think you can do that when you have the beginning stages of Alzheimer's, and, and what's more, once you do, you will remember those things. They are not, they're called procedural memories, like learning to ride a bicycle. Right. Those things don't fade. You know, if you're 80 years old um, and you haven't ridden a, a bike in, you know, 65 years, um, you can still get on it and know exactly what to do. I mean, you probably should wear a helmet and your balance won't be quite as good. But, um, but you won't forget that, and neither will you forget the arts. So if you decide, if you recognize that you have some early dementia, um, get into the arts. Um, do learn how to, how to play a simple instrument. Um, I don't know if I, I would take on you know, a very complex instrument because learning to read music is, is certainly a big challenge. On the other hand, that's one of the things that's really good for your brain. Until you have pretty advanced um, symptoms of Alzheimer's or dementia, you can do these things, and what's more, you will remember them. Um, there's a lot of evidence now that about music stimulating the, um, the brain of somebody who has um, a, a memory disease. And, well, there's there's uh, no doubt about um, that. I, yeah, yeah, there's, there's yeah. just tons of research, and there are choirs now. Um, and there's a, a group in San Francisco that I... Um, been looking at, and it's a research study on people who are over 60 joining choirs and the way that that facilitates the brain's functioning. Well, joining a choir, I mean, your voice there is the instrument. So again, uh, the quality of your, you know, again, performance is not important at this stage of life, so you don't have to have a great voice. Uh, You don't even have to have a good voice. You just have to want to be part of the community, and being part of a community also stimulates cognitive functioning. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, Francine. So, before playing, learning the cello, did you play an instrument before? Well, when I was a kid, uh, I had a rather, you know, <laughs> bad experience with the piano. I didn't like it. I didn't like practicing. I gave, you know, gave it up pretty quickly. I tried it again as an adult. I just didn't have the time or the patience. And I had no talent. So uh, that was like a, a lot of the stories of the people I wound up interviewing, although most of the people I interviewed had never done what they later did as their fine art form. Um, you know, I had a little bit of experience, but uh, I had to start all over. First of all, I never really learned how to read music very well. And, of course, now I can read music quite well for the cello. Um, I... I, I I'm much more serious about it because I I don't have all the distractions that I had earlier in my life, which is one of the points that I make in the book, that this is the first time in life when the busyness of life subsides a bit and you can really uh, focus. And by the way, speaking of focus, you can focus better at this stage of life than you could earlier because there are fewer distractions and because there are changes in the brain that allow two sides of the brains to work of the brain to work together in a way that didn't happen before and your focus can be much deeper so how, how many people did you uh, interview for for that you highlight in the book in the book there are stories of more than 20 I'm not sure maybe 22 25 by the way, the ebook is coming out um, this month, and in that book, I've added three more artists um, whose stories were so compelling that I didn't know when the first when the hardcover book came out. Uh, but altogether, I'd say 25. And originally, I was going to interview like 500 people, and it was going to be a 10-year project. And as I started interviewing people, I was so enamored with their lives. I was just so amazed by. Uh, how they found their art, I thought, I can't make this a data point. I can't be a paragraph in a chapter. It needs to be a whole chapter. 
So what I did is the whole middle of the book is is the story, the in-depth story of the lives of these more than 20 people who consider themselves very average, ordinary people, and I found them their stories to be extraordinary and very inspirational. So. Um, well, with the time with the time we have, I mean, I could probably talk to you all day about this, and but uh, let's talk about s some of the people that come to mind that uh, uh, you'd like to share with our listeners, and obviously they're going to uh, be able to learn more uh, if they get your ebook, and we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, yeah, okay. Give well, us, the, give us a couple um, examples. Old... Go ahead. No, no, I'm saying just uh, give, go ahead and give us a couple examples. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay, well, the oldest person I interviewed, when I interviewed him, he was 96. Wow. And he lives um, in central New Jersey. I went to his home, and uh, I met a man who uh, was very lively, lived independently. Uh, he has his difficulties, as anyone of 96 would. He uses a walker to get around, but he drives a car, and, and he lives in an independent community, 55-plus uh, community. And his story is like a lot of other people uh, in that he, when he, he worked all of his life, and when he retired, he looked around for something to do. He just moved to this 55-plus community with his wife. Now he is a widower. But uh, at that time, he looked around, and he uh, just decided over time, uh, so, sort of accidentally, that he would do some wood sculpting. And uh, when I interviewed him, what was really interesting about Henry was that uh, I asked him, as psychologists do, you know, what did, what did you do when you were a little boy, you know, to see whether there were any antecedents here that could help explain uh, how, and his, you know, how he became a, a wood sculptor. And he said that when he was about seven or eight, he got a pen knife for a Christmas present, and then he would whittle pieces of wood, and he would make them into little cars or trucks or trains, and he would wrap a rubber band around them and then shoot them across the floor, because <laughs> this was the day before battery-operated things, right. and that's how little boys play with stuff. And um, he even, which, made, which sort of amazed me, he even got a little cake of uh, ivory soap, which he told me he did, uh, gee, uh, almost 90 years ago, and he still carried it around with him, even though he'd moved many, many times. And he went into the other room, and he brought out this cake of ivory soap, which was almost 90 years old, and it was a little car. You could see the shape of it. Of course, it wasn't white anymore. It was speckled brown, but clearly it was a car, and this is one of the things he did as a child. So you could see where he had some interest in sculpting, carving, um, with with a knife. And then I asked him what he did as an adult, and what he told me was that um, he was a butcher. And what does a butcher do? A butcher carves meat. So there, he's the only one in all of the people that I interviewed who had sort of the seamless life. He never really thought about it, but if you connect the dots, you know, he was interested all along in using his hands and a knife for sculpting things. Wow. So here he is at 96, he can't drag around trunks of trees anymore and, and, and large objects to sculpt, but he does now wall friezes, and they're quite lovely, and they're the size of a, a wall hanging. Maybe they're uh, 15 by 20, and uh, he, there was one hanging on his wall, which was like of a cityscape, and it was all carved out, and it was, it was quite nice. He can manage that at 96. So even he, over the years had to change how he approached his art form. But it's a very important part of what keeps him healthy. He even showed me how he does a little bit of workout with his arms using uh, two and five pound weights to help him sort of stay limber enough to do what he does. You know, I'm, I'm curious, Francine, with these, it's a great story, but with, with these 20 some odd people that you interviewed, uh, did you find that they, uh, that they took up uh, these various, uh, whether it's a musical instrument or, or wood carving or whatever the case may be, that they all did it in their 60s or so? Or, I mean, did you find out any history? I mean, whether it, was there yeah. any consistency there? Uh, well, some people began to think earlier about what they would do, and they just never had time. For example, there is a 
a, an artist who um, had, he had a cousin who lived in Greenwich Village. He lived in Greenwich Village, New York, who had a basement apartment and who did oil painting. And my uh, and the artist I'm referring to said that he he loved going down there and watching this cousin paint, and he loved the smell of the paint. And many, many years later, as he was contemplating retirement, and maybe he was 10 years away from retirement, he planned to retire at 65, he began to think of what he wanted to do later. And he could have what I would describe as an olfactory memory, the memory of the smell of the oil paint. And that seemed really satisfying to him. He never painted. He never had time, like everyone else, you know, life intervenes and there are so many things to do. And so he really uh, practically salivated at the idea of starting to paint when he retired. And he was 65 when he retired. And before that, he had already set up a plan to take art lessons, painting lessons. And uh, when I met him, he was in his 80s, and he'd been doing this for 20 years. But he had anticipated it in his 50s. And sometimes it goes back even farther than that. People just know that someday they're going to do something, but they just can't do it now. Yeah, the, um, it, so with these people, have you found, did you find that uh, at least hopefully the majority of them cognitively were still pretty sharp? They were very sharp, and it's really hard for me to generalize from that because it's not really scientific when you have, um, you know, 25 people that you interview who happen to be extremely sharp to assume that that means all people who do fine arts will be sharp. But I was just, I was really impressed, and I was impressed with the quality of their lives. One of the things that happens when you get to this stage of life is that your community shrinks. When you stop working, often you lose the people in that community. When people move to a 55-plus community or, or to be closer to their kids or something like that, they lose their friends. And then at that stage of life, uh, relatives and friends um, uh, leave them through death and, um, and other circumstances. So the community can really shrink. And one of the things I notice about all of these artists is that uh, their their um, involvement in the arts moved them into a community of like-minded people, and um, and that was tremendously useful for them um, psychologically. That's uh, that's great. So uh, we we've got uh, we only have a, a couple more minutes. I mean, what suggestions? based on your research and your own personal experience, can you give to people? I mean, I'm in that category, too, you know, that are uh, hitting the 60, uh, 60 plus. And, you know, you brought up a great point um, earlier that, you know, somebody, let's say, who is a golfer and says, oh, well, when I retire, I'm just going to play golf. But they are already are a golfer. That's maybe right. not the best, you know, based on your research, nothing wrong with golfing, but you know, get into something uh, that, you know, you give your brain a little more, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, d difference uh, compared to what it's been used to doing for the first 60 years. So wh what suggestions can you give people who are approaching that age from a planning standpoint? Well, that's a great question because people are always asking me, well, how will I know what my art is or um, I've never been artistic. I have no talent. Everyone says that to me. I'm just amazed when I hear that because I don't either. But you know what? Talent doesn't matter at this stage in life. You're not looking for another career. I mean, I'm never going to play the cello like Yo-Yo Ma, and that's fine because I'm not looking for a career in performance or any career for that matter. Um, so let, let me just say this. If you were looking to start and you wanted to start with a blank slate, you have no idea. Just know you want to do something different. I would say look back to your childhood for clues to determine how you might have expressed your inner artist then. For example, as a child, were you a storyteller? A lot of the people who, who became writers told me that they, they were storytellers, so they came from storyteller kind of families. This is the forerunner to writing. Um, this is part of the oral narrative of, of many cultural traditions like Native Americans who didn't have a written language, but they told stories, and the stories, um, you know, eventually would have been written down. 
Um, or were you a, kind of a pots and pans drummer? Were you the kind of kid who took out the pots and pans and pounded on them or tried to make some other things, you know, music out of whatever materials you had around? Or are you kind of a, a, a what I call a stick-in-the-dirt artist? In other words, you, you know, it, did, you know was, when you had a sandbox, did you find yourself, you know, making designs in the sand or in the dirt? Or did you, you know, build sandcastles on the beach? Uh, so, again, look, look back to your own history to figure out what kinds of things were you interested in. And then you can, you can fast forward to how do you spend your time now? Do you prefer to attend art shows or concerts or do bookstore browsing? And think about why. So these are a couple of ways you can cue your memory sort of in the present, and you can go way back to the past, and you can think about, is there anything in my history that causes me to, to go one way or another? Great. Well, that's that's great information uh, uh, that you're sharing. And so tell me, how, I, I'm sure there's our listeners are going to, want to read your book. So how, how do they go about uh, getting information on that? Yeah. Well, the hardcover book is available at Amazon or by purchase through a, your favorite bookstore. The whole title is called The Vintage Years, Finding Your Inner Artist, Writer, Musician, Visual Artist, After 60. And uh, that one is just, it's, it's online and it's discounted, of course, at Amazon as everything else is. Uh, or you can order it directly from me, um, and I will get a, an autographed copy from the, from the publisher and send it to you. Um, or the ebook will be coming out next month, and it should be available at all places where people buy their ebooks um, through, uh, I guess, Barnes and Noble's has the Nook, and Amazon has right. a different venue. But if they, and if they want to go right uh, right to your website, uh, yes, what, what they is can that? Contact me, and I I'd be happy to. Uh, to yeah, because I'm really easy to find if you just look up my name and and my website is doctoder.com and people can contact me and I'm always interested in other people's stories too so feel free to contact me by email or if you want a book um, and, I, and especially if you want a hardcover one you want it autographed or a message on it let me know and I'll, I'll right. make arrangements for well, you. Francine, thanks so much for joining us. And again, uh, Francine Toto, you could go to her website at www.doctoder.com. Uh, her book is The Vintage Years, Finding Your Inner Artist. It was fascinating. And um, uh, Francine, thanks so much for joining us on The Aging Boomers. My pleasure, Frank. Yeah. And um, if you'd like to... Uh, not only uh, listen to this podcast again or have somebody else uh, uh, that you'd like to forward it on to, you could go to uh, the website called theagingboomers.com. Also, uh, my company, Senior Care Authority, a lot of good information uh, on that site as well at www.seniorcareauthority.com. Uh, thank you for joining us on The Aging Boomers. Be safe out there. And uh, we'll talk to you all soon.